We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, ACC. So glad you all are here for our third week of our series going through the book of Job. I wanna encourage you to grab a copy of God's word. If you don't have one, just grab one from the chair in front of you, write your name in it and keep that copy. But if you open it up about halfway in the middle, uh, you're, you're probably going to be either at Job or somewhere really close to Job. Uh, so just flip around a couple pages either direction until you find Job. We have a lot to cover today, a ton, uh, a ton of ground to cover. And so I'm going to, uh, hopefully we can all uh, stick together on this. At the end of the day, really what we've already discovered about Job uh, a quick recap, all right, is Job, this real person who really lived, is in the storm of his life. In fact, I want to set this word picture that we can carry through the whole message this morning. I want you to picture a boat, like a ship, out at sea when a storm comes up out of nowhere and just kind of surprises the, the crew of the ship. And Job is experiencing that kind of uh, all the feelings that would come along with that. He's being, you know, there's a storm on all sides. Waves are crashing against his life on all sides. All the anger and frustration and fear and worry and all the things that you would be feeling in a situation like that. Job is in the middle of the biggest storm of his life. Now, we, we see that in just in the first two chapters of the book of Job. In chapter 3, we get to see how Job starts processing his thoughts about all the things that, that, that's going on. Ultimately, what he says, I wish I had never been born. And then we see in Job chapter 4 through Job chapter 11, the initial responses from his friends. His, his friends, we've got to put some air quotes around this. There are some really lousy friends, okay? And his friends come into the situation and they start offering uh, words of, uh, what they think are words of wisdom, but we realize that they're really lousy friends. They make some pretty big assumptions and assumptions get us into trouble. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, if I were to recap last week's message in one sentence, this is what I would say, that faulty assumptions lead to faulty beliefs and faulty beliefs lead to faulty actions. And so what Job's friends do is they make some major assumptions. And to be honest, Job even makes some assumptions. And they're all operating off of some faulty understanding of how God works. And we see a bunch of back and forth as they uh, kind of argue with one another. I've made some assumptions in my life that got me into trouble. Anyone else make some bad assumptions in your life? I remember one time I had this young guy in, in sixth grade. I was a sixth grade small group leader and he was in my small group. And at one point, a, an older gentleman came up to him to kind of collect him. And I said, oh, is this your grandfather? And it was his dad. And I, I, that guy never let me live that down. Every time I'd see him, he would tell me, I'm that old guy, right? The old grandpa. Uh, I also made a mistake once, never again, of thinking a man's mother uh, sorry, a man's wife was his mother. That one will really get you into hot water. I, I remember another assumption I made one time. I was working at a bank early on um, in my 20s. I was working in a, a fraud department of a large credit card bank called Barclays. And the CEO of Barclays US, we're talking like 10,000 employees, sent an email thanking the fraud department for something that we had just done. And I assumed it was an email that was just for my small team. And so I decided it would be funny to reply all a funny little quip back to what he had said. It was funny. It wasn't important. It wasn't serious. And then realized afterwards, my boss said, you know, you just sent that to 10,000 people. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes we make assumptions they lead to faulty beliefs, 
which lead to faulty actions. And what we see is Job is having this conver- these conversations with his, his really lousy friends. And they're all making a bunch of assumptions that and they're, they're trying to wrestle with and trying to figure out what's, what's true. And, and so we, we see that going back and forth. All last week we covered chapter 4 through chapter 11 of Job. That was a lot of ground to cover in one week. This week we're going to cover even more ground. All right? We're going to cover chapter 12 through chapter 31, all right? So we're going to be here for about four hours. Just kidding. I'm going to fit it all in, but here's my point. You're going to have to go and read these chapters for yourself. I'm going to give you an overview of what's happening in Job chapter 12 through 31, and so you'll have a basic understanding of what's going on. But the big idea One of the things I love about Job is there's this conversation going back and forth between him and his friends, right? That that conversation's happening, but really what, what they're doing is they're trying to answer three questions. They're trying to find and and agree on the answer to three different questions. The first question that Job's friends and Job are both trying to answer is number one, is God just? The second question is does God exact justice on humanity the way that we would expect him to? Does, is there a, a system of fairness that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people? Does God work out justice like that on this earth? They're trying to understand that. And the third thing would be, and then how does that relate to Job's current situation? Based on everything that just happened to Job, he lost all of his stuff, all of his animals, all his business, all his livelihood, all 10 of his children, and now he's lost his health, and he's sitting there wanting to be dead. What does that mean for Job in Job's current situation? So here's what the friends, here's how they would answer those three questions. They would say, one, God is just. They got that right. They, they would also say that God does exact justice on humanity the way that, that we would think would be fair. In other words, they would say good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. Pastor John talked about that last week, or the algebra of righteousness. That's their perspective. And so therefore, they would say, Job, God is just, and good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. So looking at what's going on in your life, you are in sin, and you're just not willing to admit it. That's Job's friend's perspective. That's what they think. Now, Job, though, uh, Job insists that he's innocent, right? In Job chapter 6, earlier on, this is what he said, stop assuming my guilt. He says, for I have done no wrong. Do you think I am lying? Don't I know the difference between right and wrong? And so Job is standing in a perspective where he's saying, listen, I happen to know that when I'm trying to figure out, is God just, and do only good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, I happen to have a new perspective on this. Trust me, guys, I'm innocent. We understand that Job had sin in his life. We find out in these chapters that Job had sin from his childhood because we're all broken humans. But at this season of his life, he's telling his friends, listen, this isn't happening to me because of sin that's in my life right now. I need you to trust me. So his perspective is a little different. The way he would answer these questions would be, I am innocent. So either God is unjust or he doesn't rule the world by our basic understanding of justice. And so that's his perspective. And what we see is this back and forth conversation between Job and Job's friends as they're trying to understand the answers to these three questions together. Now to give you a brief synopsis before I zoom in and give you something really tangible to walk away with, you're going to notice as you read chapters 12 through 31 that there's a few things that kind of you're going to notice over and over again. The first one, how many of you in this room, uh, one of your languages that you speak really well is the language of sarcasm. Some of you are really good. Well, listen, Job could teach a master class on sarcasm. As his friends say stuff to him, he quips back, he defends himself, and almost every time he starts with some sort of sarcasm. I'll give you an example of that real quick. 
In Job 26, 1 through 4, it says, Then Job spoke again, How you have helped the powerless, how you have saved the weak, how you have enlightened my stupidity. What wise advice you have offered. Where have you gotten all these wise sayings? Whose spirit speaks through you? I want you to understand that Job isn't actually saying any of this to his friends. He's speaking sarcastically to them. You're going to see a lot of sarcasm in these responses back and forth. Another thing you'll see a lot of is a lot of similarity. The reason why we're not going to take Job chapter 12 and then teach that and then teach Job chapter 13 and then teach Job chapter 14 is because it would be the same sermon over and over and over again. Because throughout these chapters, you see his friends making the same arguments and then Job coming back with the same response. And then his friends make the same argument over again and Job comes back with the same response. There's a few little differences, but have you ever noticed this in your own arguments at home? And my wife and I sometimes will get into a small argument over something really silly. And then we'll have our back and forth bickering about the thing that we're talking about. And we'll realize like four hours later, right, that we've been saying the exact same thing to each other over and over again. And that it's silly until one of us or both of us at the same time comes to our senses and says, what are we even talking about right now? That's exactly what's happening with Job and his friends. A lot of similarity in what they're saying back and forth to each other. Uh, You'll see that in here. Another thing you'll see a lot of, the third thing I think you'll see a lot of as you read 12 through 31, is a lot of speculation. So you got a lot of sarcasm, a lot of similarity, and a lot of speculation. Speculation is just another word for making assumptions, right? Job's friends make a lot of assumptions. They assume to know things. Essentially what they're doing, I want you to understand this, is they're playing a little game called who's wiser, Job's friends are like, listen, we are wiser than you. We understand God's word more than you. God is speaking to us right now because we don't have the sin in in our lives that you have in your life. We have clarity. We are wiser than you are, Job. You need to listen to us. And Job is on the other side saying, no, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I'm just as wise or wiser than you are. And they're having this whole contest for who's wiser. Any of you guys ever had a friend or someone in your life who was a know-it-all? Like you couldn't convince them of anything because everything they thought, they were right and they were stubborn about it. They knew everything. Well, I want you to understand, let me give you a little bit of an example of this. So Job, as far as who's wiser, Job starts in Job 12 verse 2 with some of that infamous sarcasm, right? He says, you people really know everything, don't you? Oh, my friends, I think they know it all is what he's saying. And then Job's, one of his friends says in chapter 15, were you listening at God's secret counsel? Do you, Job, have a monopoly on wisdom? And then they even use this uh, a logical fallacy called appear, uh, an appeal to authority, where they say this in uh, Job 15 verse 10. They say, on our side... Are aged, gray haired men much older than your father? You see what's happening here is they're going back and forth arguing about why all these things are happening to Job. And they're both saying, We have a better understanding of what's going on in your life. We understand God. We have more wisdom than the other people. Job, we have more wisdom than you. And Job's saying, No, I have more wisdom than you, guys. And this conversation goes back and forth even before chapter 12, all the way through chapter 31. It's a bit exhausting to watch this go back and forth. Now, I want you to picture that, that boat out in the storm again. You're out, you got a boat out in the storm, and there's waves crashing in from every single angle, and it's being tossed, uh, and, and, and the, obviously the, the captain, you, the cap, if you imagine if you're the captain of the boat, how scared you would be. Well, I did a little bit of research about what are you supposed to do if you are in the storm of your life, and you're out in a boat, what is the right thing to do? I didn't know. I was like, well, are we supposed to like angle the boat a certain way? Are we supposed to push through the storm a certain direction? Are we, what, what are you supposed to do? And the, actually the correct answer is, 
Uh, you're supposed to, assuming that you can't get in to shore where it's safe or it, behind some sort of barrier, if you're just out there in the middle of a storm, you're supposed to drop anchor and buckle down. It's going to keep your boat from, from getting tossed all over the place, from wandering way off path and getting lost out in the, at sea somewhere, from being destroyed. You want to drop an anchor, get it all the way down, anchored really firmly into the sand at the bottom of the ocean, and you just want to ride it out there with an anchor down in the ground. And what's, what's so awesome about these conversations that go back and forth between Job and Job's friends is you see what Job is really saying. If you really think about what's going on in Job's life right now, Job is trying to align his knowledge of God with his feelings. I don't want you to miss this. Job is trying to align what he knows to be true about God with how he's currently feeling about God. I bet all of us in this room have been in that situation before, where you've, you know, you, you know your pastor has told you for years, and the Bible has told you for years, and your friends and your parents have told you for years that God is good, and that he's fair, and that he's just, and, and that he's a good father, and a good father treats their children a certain way. And Job knows all of this stuff. And so all these things are happening to him and he's sitting there wrestling saying, I don't know what to do with all the things that are happening to me right now because they don't line up with what I thought to be true. How do I, how do I merge these things and come to some sort of peace with everything that's happening in my life right now? You know, as you read through, you're going to see all of Job's struggles that he's experiencing, all the feelings that he has going on in his mind. You get to read those. It's so raw and honest. Job isn't holding anything back. As you read chapter 12 through 31, you're going to hear that Job, let me give you some of the things that he's feeling right now. He feels completely, according to him, hopeless. All hope is gone, according to Job. He feels completely confused. All the things he thought, he, he uh, understood the way God was acting in his life and the way God would, would, would treat him. All those things are now out, out the door. He has no idea what's going on. He feels as if God hates him. It's very clear in scripture that he says, God now hates me. He feels... All sorts of things. He feels like he wants to be dead. He feels like he wishes he had never been born. And now that he has been born, which he regrets, he wishes God would just take his life. He feels all of these things so strongly throughout these chapters. And what I hope you're picturing as I'm explaining this is that there are just waves crashing and crashing and crashing onto Job's boat. He's not literally in a boat, all right? But picture this picture that he's, he's feeling like he's in the storm of his life and what we experience when we're in the storm of our life is what Job is experiencing, right? And, and what Job teaches us is when you're in a storm, when you got all these feelings, when you got all these thoughts and they, you're trying to align them with what you know to be true about God, you have to drop an anchor into the ground and ride out the storm. And what are the anchors that Job teaches us? What are the things that Job knows to be true? You know, what's even worse though for Job is not only is he experiencing the loss of all these things, the loss of his health, the loss of his children, the loss of his business, the loss of his wealth and his home and everything. But he also doesn't have any friends that he can go to for comfort. Imagine not even having a friend to comfort you through all this. This is how he describes his friends. In Job 16 verse 2, he says, what miserable comforters you are. In Job 19 verse 2, how long will you torture me? How long will you try to crush me with your words? 
You know what I love about a pattern that I see whenever Job is defending himself to his friends? You're going to see that Job actually has three different audiences for his words. The first, every time Job opens his mouth, the, the people that Job is speaking to are his friends. His friends just said, Job, God is just. He, he doesn't let bad things happen to good people, so you must be a bad person. And Job opens his mouth and defends himself directly to them. He speaks to his friends. Then you notice that he shifts almost every time, and he starts to talk to God. He was just talking to his friends, and now he's saying, God, and he starts talking to God. And then what happens is unique. He stops talking to God, and he starts talking to himself. It's as if he's saying, listen, I go to my friends, and they're not providing any counsel or comfort to me that's helpful. And I'm going to God, and right now it seems like you hate me. It doesn't seem like you have anything good for me. I don't really understand what's going on. So I'm going to have to go over here where, where the only, I guess I'm just going to have to counsel myself. It seems as if Job gets to a place where he's saying, if I'm going to get any counsel, I guess it's going to have to come from what I know to be true. Job drops an anchor on some core truths that he knows are true. When you got feelings, you got to compare them to the truths, the things that you know to be true. And then those truths will help you sort through the feelings to know whether or not those feelings are coming from a place of truth or from a place of lies. And that's what Job teaches us how to do. So that's what I want to show you. Job is going to show us his anchors, the things that he knows to be true amid suffering and doubt. I want to show you a verse that I think is really powerful in this. It's, it's really a, just a part of one verse. In Job chapter 12, verse 3, the very first part, here's what he says. He says, well, I know a few things myself. Will you say the word no with me? No. That's right. Here's what Job is saying. Here's what he's not saying. How about this? Job isn't saying, you know what? I feel like a certain, certain things are true. He doesn't say, I, I, I assume certain things to be true. He doesn't say either of those things. He says, I know a few things myself. This is the best thing that you can do when you're in the middle of suffering in your life. When you're suffering in your life, instead of focusing on what you feel or what you assume or what you want or what you need, just go back to some anchors down in the sand and say, you know what, I'm going to ride out the storm, not on what I think or what I feel or what I want or what I assume, but what, on, but what I know to be true. And Job gives us six of these things. Job says, these are six things that I know to be true, and I'm going to drop that anchor and it's going to help me get through this storm because I, if I were going off my feelings right now, it would be pretty nasty. Here's the first one. The first anchor that Job drops is number one, God is the only one who is truly wise. God is the only one who is truly wise. While his friends claim to have a better grasp on wisdom, and Job claims to have a better grasp on wisdom, Job says, you know what? <laughs> Maybe my friends know something I don't know. Maybe my friends are right. Maybe they're wrong. I, here's what I do know, is that the only one who is always right is God. I don't know why he's doing any of this in my life. I don't know why all these Waves are crashing up along the side of my boat. I don't know why I'm in this storm, but I do know that God is the only one who is truly wise. Let me show you a few examples of that. In Job 12, verse 13, it says, here's Job in the middle of a storm saying, but true wisdom and power are found in God. Counsel and understanding are his. It's as if Job says, I don't understand what's going on. 
I don't have enough wisdom to tell you why all this is happening, but I can tell you who is wise enough. God is wise enough. God is the only one who is truly wise. I want to show you guys a magic trick. You guys want to see a magic trick? Um, I got in my pockets uh, a Sharpie and some uh, post-it notes, uh, nothing written on them. I'm just going to uh, read a few, few of your minds. Is that all right? Have you ever had someone read your mind before? It can be a pretty tricky business, but uh, um, Janae, I'm going to start with you. I didn't tell you I was going to do this, right? This isn't like a set, a plant, anything like that. All right, I want you to think of any girl's name that comes to mind. All right, don't, um, don't think of something that I would uh, just immediately, don't pick one of your kids or, you know, okay. Uh, so a girl's name, all right, I'm going to write down what I think you're thinking. So think of it real hard. Okay. All right, I'm going to take my prediction and ball it up right here and set it right on the edge of the table so all you can see it. I think I got it right. Uh, what girl's name were you thinking of? No. Say? No. <laughs> Crap. Ah. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. Only God is truly wise. Um, it's okay. Um, Jaren. Can you help me out? Uh, can you give me uh, a name of a city? All right, so think of a city. Don't say it out loud. I got to read your mind. You thinking of it? Think of it a little harder for me. Okay. All right, I think I got it. Let me uh, take my prediction. Put it right here at the edge of the table. Uh, what What city? <laughs> oh, um, okay, that's good. Um, Phoenix, that's okay. That's pretty close, pretty close. Uh, Dan, can you help me out? Um, let's go, let's go something simple. I, I hopefully you don't mind me asking this. Uh, don't, don't tell me yet, but I want you to think of your age. Just let it stay on the tip of your brain. All right, I could really make my, I get myself in a lot of trouble here. Um, all right. Okay, I think I got it. I'm going to take my prediction and put it right here. So would it be pretty cool if I was able to read everyone's minds? If I was, uh, now there was no plants, right? I didn't tell you beforehand. I have no idea when your birthday is. Uh, uh, all right. So now what we need to do is figure out if I, Actually, I'm able to read minds or not. Let me open these up and see what we got. On the front row, you're going to have to confirm. Uh, what does that say right there? Say Janelle. <laughs> Janelle right there. It's a girl's name. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right. That was a good one. All right. And then right here, uh, what, is, what does that say? My handwriting that bad? Uh, does it say Phoenix. Do you see it? Here, here. Uh, maybe it's really, really bad. That you can just confirm. Does that say Phoenix? All right, it does. Yep, thank you. All right, and over here, I, man, I really hope I didn't screw this up. I wrote um, 52. Is that right? Oh, woo! Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> last week, right? I shouldn't have said that. Now you all figure out how I know the truth. Anyway. Now you might think, hey, Pastor Matt just told us that only God knows everything. But now we all know that God and Pastor Matt know all things, right? <laughs> but clearly, if you're paying attention, right, Pastor Matt does not know all things. There's got to be a trick here. Some of you know the trick. You've already figured out the trick. And you're not that impressed by it. But it's got to be a trick because at the end of the day, only God is truly wise, God knew what you were thinking before you said it. I did not, all right? It was a trick. And so the, 
we got we to gotta understand that Job realizes in the middle of a season, the middle of a storm, the middle of suffering, the middle of doubt, he could put an anchor down in the ground and saying, well, you know what? I don't know why this is happening to me. But God, I believe, is wise. I can rest in that. I'll give you a few other examples of that. Job 21, verse 22 says, But who can teach a lesson to God, since he judges even the most powerful? Or Job 28, Job says, God alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found, for he looks throughout the whole earth and sees everything under the heavens. Do you understand that Job recognizes that God is the only one who is truly wise? All right, number two, the second anchor that Job teaches us to put down when we're in the middle of a storm is that God is sovereign over all things. That God is in control, that God knows all things, that God has a purpose in all things, right? That God is sovereign over all things. I'll show you some scripture that backs us up in Job 12, verse 10. Job says, for the life of every living thing is in his hand, and the breath of every human being. If you keep reading in verse 23, he says that God builds up the nations and he destroys them. He expands nations and he abandons them. He strips kings of understanding and leaves them wandering in a pathless wasteland. What he's essentially saying in a lot of Job chapter 12 is God gives and God takes away. God is sovereign. He has the ability to decide when these things happen and why they happen. He goes on in, in chapter 14, verse 5, he says, You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. Are you guys all gathering with me that Job knows, not Job feels, Job knows that God is sovereign? You picking up on this? All the other things in his life are confusing at this moment, but he certainly knows that God is sovereign. He goes on, uh, I'll give you another example. Job 23, he says, But once he has made his decision, who can change his mind? Whatever he wants to do, he does. So he will do to me whatever he has planned. He controls my destiny. Job 26 really focuses on God being sovereign over creation. And here's what Job says in verse 14. He says, these are just the beginning of all that he does. Merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? So I want to understand that Job knows that God is wise. And Job knows that God is sovereign. And this really leads us to the third thing. We're talking about the thunder of his power. Job also wants you to know that God should be feared. God should be feared. Now this one sounds a little more ominous, right? I'm not talking about feared as in like, you need to go crawl into a corner and ball up and you know, start sucking your thumb kind of feared, right? We're not talking about like the, the movies that come out around Halloween kind of fear. We're talking about a reverent awe and understanding of the might and power of God. Job recognizes this, and he never denies it. In fact, let me show you some of the things that he says. In Job 13, starting in verse 8, he says, he's talking to his friends, and he says, Will you slant your testimony in his favor? Will you argue God's case for him? What will happen when he finds out what you are doing? Can you fool him as easily as you fool people? No, you will be in trouble with him. If you secretly slant your testimony in his favor, doesn't his majesty terrify you? Doesn't your fear of him overwhelm you? To understand what his friend just did, his friend just said, hey, I'm speaking to you with more wisdom than you have. In fact, I want you to know, God told me to tell you this. The friend is coming and actually claiming to speak on behalf of God in Job's life. And Job's like, hold on, I know what you're telling me is that I am broken in in sin right now, but I want you to know, I happen to know that that's not true. Do you really want to now speak lies and attach them to God's name? 
Do you not have a fear of God? Job is showing us that he certainly does fear God. God should be feared. Job 23 Verse 15 says, no wonder I am so terrified in his presence. When I think of it, terror grips me. There was a couple of years ago that uh, some of the pastors at this church and I, we, we went out to spend some time together and we, we went on a charter fishing boat uh, not far from here. And we went out, it was supposed to be an all day trip. The boat went out kind of far enough where you weren't really seeing land anymore. And it was, uh, it, was, it was supposed to be an all-day thing. About halfway through, the captain of the ship says, hey, there's a storm coming out of nowhere. We really need to get back right away. It's, uh, it's not looking good. So we get everything, you know, we, we take as long as we can and, uh, or go as quick as we can to try to fish as long as we can, but get everything. And we start heading back. And I'm telling you, I mean, I thought the storm hit while we were still on our way back into to land. And we're in the middle of this storm. And it's, the waves are way bigger than I felt like the boat was, be, was built to handle. I'm thinking we are surely going to die on the way back in to land. Uh, we're all just kind of sitting there. I remember when we got back and we, we, we survived it, right? And I asked the captain of the boat. I'm like, I was terrified. Were you scared? And I'm thinking that he's going to say, oh, my boat's handled way worse than that. But he said, and this is a quote, I've never been scareder. I'm like, whew. Here's the thing. There's something about the, like the ocean. If you've ever just walked up on a beach, right? And you're standing out and looking out at an ocean and waves are coming in. And you recognize that that thing out there, that ocean can kill you like a hundred different ways. There's something so powerful about it. There's something so incredible about it that you kind of have to revere it, right? You stand in the ocean with reverence. You don't just go into that thing willy-nilly. You understand that there's things in there that'll kill you. There's undertow that'll pull you under. There's all sorts of the, the ocean in a healthy way should be feared. Not like don't go in it but revere it and understand the power of it. And what Job is saying, and I think it's important for all of us to know this, I want you to know this too. It's okay for you to have feelings. It's okay for you to have doubts. It's okay for you, you ready for this, to be angry at God. In fact, I want you to know all the things that you're feeling, if you're thinking, you know what, I shouldn't mention those to God uh, because that, that would be offensive to him, I want you to know God already knows everything you're thinking and feeling. If you think he can't read your mind, he knows you better than you know yourself. You might as well go to him and say, God, I don't understand this. I don't like this. This doesn't make sense to me. I feel like you hate me right now. What's going on with us? I thought we were buddies. What is go to God with all those things. But you want to be very careful to make sure your anger never turns into contempt. Don't let your anger turn into contempt. And Job has a fear of God that's so strong that while he's angry and frustrated and mad and feels hated by God, he still says, oh, but I'm definitely not going to show contempt to someone so powerful. Here's number four. God is alive. Job knows that God didn't die, that God didn't disappear on him. He knows that in the midst of everything that he's going through, that while he doesn't understand it, he knows that God is still living. And what he says in Job chapter 19 is probably uh, two of the best verses that show you where Job is anchored in the midst of the storm. In, in Job 19 verse 25 and 26, it says this, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Huh. Can you imagine? Like, as for me, right now, I feel like my God hates me. I feel like my God isn't very fair. I feel like my God hurt me really badly. I feel this, I feel that, 
I feel this, I feel that. I feel like I want to be dead. I feel like I want to be gone. I wish I'd never been born, but I know that my Redeemer lives. That's the one thing I can anchor into right now in the midst of all these feelings. He says, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body, I will see God. See, while it seems like Job has lost all hope, Scripture repeats itself throughout these chapters where Job keeps saying, all hope is gone. There's no hope left. I have no hope in me. I'm out of hope. And then he says something like this, where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. You've got to hear a little bit of hope that's built into this truth, right? Essentially what Job is saying, think about the word Redeemer. To redeem something means to buy it back. I think of a story of of a boy. He built this model boat. He took the wood and and the lacquer, and he glued everything together, and he built this thing. He spent a lot of time building this boat, and it was precious to him. And he got it so that it could hold, that, so that it was, you know, they could float on water without, you know, sinking. And he, one day he took it out to a, a, a river, and he hooked it up to some rope, and he want, wanted to see his boat out there floating. And it was wonderful. He enjoyed it for the whole afternoon. He was playing with his boat. And then uh, kind of a, a storm came in and the, the river started going a little heavier and higher than normally flows. And his boat got, got washed away. He got detangled in something and kind of floated down river. And he started looking for it until it got dark. But eventually he gave up. And it was about three days later, he's walking in town and he sees this toy shop. And he sees a boat in the front window that looks just like his. And so he gets up really close to it, and he sees it, and it's got his initials on it. He's like, this is my boat. He gets super excited, so he goes into the toy shop, and he finds the owner. He says, sir, you have my boat in the front window. I lost it, but that's it. I would like it back. And he said, well, you know, someone found it, and they brought it in and sold it to me. So it's my boat. But if you'd like, you can buy it for a dollar. So the boy went home. He mustered up all his change and he had about just, just about a dollar. And he went back and he bought the boat. And as he's walking out, hugging this boat, the shop owner hears him say, and he says, twice mine. First I made you, and now I bought you. You see, that's what a redeemer does. God made you. He loves you because he made you. But he's also the kind of God that then buys you back, even though he made you and already owns you. And Job, deep down all of his hurt, he knows, you know what? I don't feel a lot of good stuff, but I know that God is a redeemer God and that he's alive. In Job 19, verse 27, it says, I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Don't miss this church. Job knows that God is alive. Job knows that God is wise, that he's sovereign over all things, that he should be feared, and that he's alive. He doesn't know much else. We're going to hear two other things, but he knows those things. Here's the, the fifth thing I want you to know that Job knows. These are anchors that you put down when you're in the middle of a storm, is God is good. God is good. Now, if I'm being honest here, and as you read Job's account, this is probably one of the areas that Job struggles and doubts in the most. This is one of the areas where Job, as you read his words, it doesn't sound like he actually believes in this moment that God is all that good. But what we see in some of the statements that he makes, is that at the end of the day, deep down in his soul, he knows that though he doesn't see or feel like God is good, he knows that God is good. Let me show you an example of that. In Job 23, verses 6 through 7, you know, Job says he really wants to go plead his case before God. He says, I wish I could just stand before God and tell him all that I'm feeling He says this, would he use his great power to argue with me? No. 
He would give me a fair hearing. Honest people can reason with him. So I would be forever acquitted by my judge. What do we hear about the deep down heart, the knowledge of Job? He knows that God is just and good. He knows it. Remember we talked two weeks ago about one of the best things you can do in a season of doubt and struggle is what Job did, right? He dropped to his knees in worship. And this is, there's so many songs written about the goodness of God. I challenge you, the next time that your feelings tell you that God is not good, I want you to drop to your knees and find your favorite song about the goodness of God and just worship him. Let that reminder soak over you over and over again. Remember we sang the song, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. You might have to say it a thousand times. <laughs> you might have to just keep singing it over and over again. But at the end of the day, that's a truth. That, that's an anchor that'll get you through the storm. Know that God is good. And here's number six. Number six is that God must have a purpose in all my struggles. Job, at the end of the day, he knows I don't know why all this is happening. I don't like it. It doesn't seem right. If I were in charge, I'd do things differently. But God must have a purpose in all this. Here's where we see Job land on this truth. In Job 23, verse 10, it says, But he knows where I am going. And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. For I have stayed on God's paths. I have followed his ways and not turned aside. I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. What we learn in seasons of struggle as Christians, believers in this room, you've probably experienced this, is we know that scripture teaches us that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. And we might be in a season where we don't understand why God is doing something in our lives. In fact, think about Job for a moment. Job never learns about the conversation that happened in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Job never learns about why God allowed this to happen in his life. I hope that he's in heaven now and that he's gotten the answer. But sometimes you're going to go through things in your life and they're not going to make sense to you. And you're not going to like them. And you're going to want to know why they're happening to you. You're like, listen, I can, get a, I can get behind God, you being good, if you can tell me how you're working this out for good. Why don't you give me the 10-year picture from now? And maybe if I understand that, I can feel good about you being good. Job doesn't ever get that. But he's still able to land on a simple truth God must be using this for good. He must be working out something. There must be a purpose in all of my struggle. So, we're going we're gonna to ask God what he wants us to do with all this. We say, what now, God? And in this room right now, I believe in every one of these sections of seating in this room, there's a handful of you that are in a season right now of doubt. You're in a season of struggle. You're in a season where you got all sorts of feelings of anger and frustration and confusion. You don't understand why certain things are happening to your life. And my, my advice to you from God's word, from the story of Job, is to drop these six anchors into the sand they will help you ride out the storm. You don't have to, to live off all of your feelings and opinions and assumptions when you can go by what you know to be true. And so I want to encourage you to write down on your notes this morning where it says, what now, God? Which one of these anchors do you need to drop? Maybe it's all six of them. What are the anchors that you need in your life right now? They're saying, listen, I don't understand this, but I do know that God is good. I don't understand this, but I know God is wise. I don't really get this, but I know God's sovereign. 
I don't understand this, but I know God must have a purpose in my struggle. Trade out what you feel for what you know. I wanna share with you a quote that I heard for the first time this week preparing this message. And it's really kind of rocked my world a little bit. I'm gonna put it on the screen. It fits really well with this, right? It's Charles Spurgeon. He says, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. If you haven't been in church for a while, you might be, I don't understand what that means. Rock of ages, that's just a, like a fancy biblical phrase that, that, point, that means God. And Charles Spurgeon says, I've gone through enough struggle in my life that every time a wave is crashing against my boat, every time my boat is, is crashed against a rock, I've learned to kiss that wave because it pushes me closer to God. And we're gonna learn more about Job's story next week, more about how that relates to our lives next week. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this book. Thank you for the story of Job. Thank you that we've learned that no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what we feel, no matter what we assume or speculate, no matter whether we got good friends or bad friends, good advice or bad advice, we know, we know, we know that you are truly wise, that you are sovereign over all things, that you should be feared, that you are good, that you are alive, and that you must have a purpose in all of our struggle. Help those anchors to hold us in a place while all of the things that are rocking against our lives try to mess us up. God, thank you for helping us ride out the storm. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings, please remember this, you belong at ACC.